Hi everyone, we are live. Welcome to our weekly debrief. Welcome, Dietrich. Good to see you. Hi Daniela, long time no see. <laughs> <laughs> right, so um, people are still coming on as usual. Um, this is our debrief online. I think it's part three. And uh, I will uh, stop the chat as soon as you start lecturing. Um, and then I will let you know, if you're okay with that, I will let you know 10 minutes before the end of the hour so that you know where we yeah. are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. So we are almost half uh, full. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. <laughs> it's good to see so many of you. It's been a long time. <laughs> yeah, hi, everybody. <clears throat> this is actually life. We are actually really here. <clears throat> <laughs> we are really here. Yes. Um, right, okay. So I think we are almost ready to start. Do you want to share screen with us? Um, yeah, I've, I've, not yet? yeah I've, I've first talked a little bit and then... Okay. <clears throat> Okay. okay, well, let's get, let's get to it. So, okay. <clears throat> yeah, um, so thanks for tuning in. Um, the, um, I know we're living in interesting times um, and it's getting more interesting uh, by the day. We'll talk a little bit about that at the end. Uh, but for now, I just want to keep the focus on Lyme disease. Yeah, as I said, maybe last time, um, we do have a true um, pandemic uh, in the world, <clears throat> and that pandemic, uh, I would rather say, is a pandemic of chronic Lyme disease and um, generally uh, chronic viral infections, heavy metal and environmental toxicity. Um, <clears throat> uh, there's a true pandemic there. And so um, I decided with these talks to give you some guidance uh, in terms of diagnosing and treating uh, Lyme disease. You know, so um, as a reminder, um, Lyme disease is really a hotspot uh, right now of several uh, chronic infections that are lumped together under that term. <clears throat> that used to be strictly the infection with Borrelia burgdorferi. So now we have many different species of Borrelia, Myamotoi, Garinihi, um, and many, many offshoots, uh, including other countries, uh, where by I would like to highlight uh, the, the point that most of the other infections like Babesia, Bartonella, uh, were around for a very long time. You know, the, the mummies had Bartonella, they found a, a tooth in a mummy that was full of uh, Bartonella. So these things have been around for several thousand years. What is new, the new kid on the block is Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, th there's no question that brought a whole different flavor uh, to this illness or this group of illnesses. And uh, for us practitioners who use ART, autonomic response testing, it becomes very clear when we conquer some of the infections, the mycoplasma, Babesia, um, what is usually left is a deep level of Borrelia burgdorferi, usually deep in the limbic system. Yeah? And so we talk a little bit about how to look at that and, and what to do with it. And the patient um, usually makes huge progress when we're touching on that place uh, in the system. So let me switch to PowerPoint here so we get a little bit more visual. I put my glasses on. Okay, so as a reminder, um, it was a grave mistake to call these illnesses tick-borne diseases, as still some do. Uh, the proper term is vector-borne disease because, as outlined here, just a small compilation, there is many other ways of acquiring these illnesses. Fleas, mosquitoes, deer flies, horse flies, spider bites, 
Yeah, and there is pretty much any insect that stings can give you the seed for this illness that then depending on if it's a tick bite, it grows fast in you because the tick bite comes with an enzyme or set of enzymes that helps the bugs very quickly to penetrate very deeply into your system. Um, like two minutes into the brain is the current estimate. Um, uh, whereas, you know, a, a spider bite, you may have a localized nest of the bugs in the bite that itches and burns for even a couple of weeks before it slowly uh, spreads out from there via the bloodstream and the lymphatics and then uh, sets up housekeeping different body parts and it may take 10-15 years <clears throat> for the bugs to achieve the number that is needed to give you symptoms. Now, of course there's always a hope <clears throat> that your own immune system conquers the situation uh, on the way there. Uh, by the way, I have to apologize. I got chronic bronchitis that I have not been able to take care of properly. So if I have a coughing spell, forgive me. So <clears throat> um, here's a, a group of people that have picked up um, the idea we were in a think tank together. Bob Bransfield is a famous psychiatrist who really has uh, had, had the courage to suggest that many psychiatric illnesses <clears throat> are really the outcome of Lyme disease and the treatment of Lyme should be included, at least that the diagnostic workup <coughs> should be included with anyone who's got any psychiatric illness. That includes autism, it includes senile dementia, uh, it includes Parkinson's disease and it includes all the schizoaffective disorders, manic depression and so on and so forth. And so <coughs> this team here, Bob Bransfield, Jeff Wolfman, who is a GP, doing really good work. Andrew Usman, um, many of you know her, she's one of our main gurus and autism treatment, beautiful practitioner. <coughs> and so he simply was reviewed how often uh, an, an autistic child <coughs> is diagnosed. How often do we find Lyme disease or one of the infections? And it's just very, very common. So the other side of that is, you know, if Lyme disease is causing autism or contributes to it, then treating it conventionally with antibiotic should lead to an improvement. You know? And we see the sentence down at the bottom, um, after six months of antibiotic therapy, um, there were improvements in speech, eye contact, sleep, <coughs> and the reduction of repetitive behaviors. Okay, so now moving forward to um, some of the newer treatments. Um, a big uh, breakthrough came in 2018 um, when it was published that desulfuram, the drug more commonly known as ant abuse, um, can make a dramatic positive difference in the treatment of Lyme disease. And we may have talked in one of the previous Lyme talks about it already. Um, the, the good news is it certainly works in some patients that have Lyme disease. Um, I would say in about half the people. And in their group, we certainly have seen some miracles, really dramatic improvements. But the other half either doesn't respond or uh, gets uh, serious side effects. You know, we, we've seen neuropathies, chronic pain flaring up. And the, the trouble with the desulfuram is once you get the flare up of pain syndromes, when you stop the drug, the pain syndrome can be flared up for up to several months uh, afterwards. And so it's um, a bit of a Russian roulette um, to use it. You can't trust um, that the patient is not gonna be in that category. At least um, it, I'm, I'm pretty sure by now uh, some of you have looked at genetic profiles and maybe predict some of the bad outcome 
some of you have looked at the metabolome at, at the different lab values and probably are able to narrow down the group of patients that would have an adverse reaction. Um, we use ART testing and it has been an excellent tool, but this has not been perfect. You know? And so um, just for those of you who want to use it, you know, it comes in the US in 250 milligram tablets, in Europe in 400 milligram tablets. And so in general, the agreement here is you start with the quarter tablet that's 62.5 milligrams twice a week, and then gradually, gradually tiptoe your way up um, until you're at the full treatment dose, which is sort of closer to 250 milligrams twice a day. Um, some articles that use uh, for, for like for COVID, they use a thousand milligrams twice a day for a week. Um, that's a risky high dose. Um, you know, so there's a wide dosage range um, but the tiptoeing your way in has been a very good approach. Um, I think my old friend, Dr. Kinderlehrer, has been a leader in the field with that, and he probably uh, could give some good guidance as when trouble comes up, <laughs> what to do. Um, I'm just, um, I'm not using antibiotics personally. I show you my treatment, um, which is very different, but uh, the, the saffron is worthwhile paying attention to. Good. And here's uh, just some other articles, you know, on using um, desulfiram for the treatment of Lyme disease. You know? And so um, we, those of you who obtain the PowerPoint, you, know, you will get the, the whole thing and you can, uh, you know, orient yourself uh, in that way. Uh, so um, in general, it's assumed that the neuropathy is that may, may come up is a deficiency of vitamin B1. That's probably the most common belief in there. And so we pre-medicate people with benfotiamine, which is seemed to be the more active form of, um, of vitamin B1. And that has been a good policy. When people have independent, often chronic pain and chronic um, neurological disease have independently of the disulfiram improvements by benfotiamine. You know, we, we know from alcoholics that, that the alcoholic neuropathy, when alcoholics get leg pain mostly, you know, and, and pain in other body parts, um, that that's a deficiency of vitamin B1. And when I worked with alcoholics in the past, you just simply inject vitamin B1 once or twice a week, and that would greatly improve the situation. Now we have the more active oral forms which are pretty much as good as the injection for most people. Okay, so a little bit reviewing the Bartonella um, issue. Bartonella, in the experience of most Lyme literate uh, practitioners, is the hardest one to treat. Yeah, so Bartonella is not a <coughs> beginner's, uh, beginner's field. And so the, the main symptoms, you know, Bartonella that you may want to keep in mind is anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder. And uh, of course, the fatigue and brain fog that always goes with it. And then Bartonella specifically likes the big joints, the hip joint, the knee joint, the ankle joint, um, also the neck. And so the, the ideal treatment for that is simple ozone injections into the joint. Um, sometimes you see a really dramatic improvement for six months after you know, injecting a knee joint with 10 cc's of ozone. So uh, I, I do believe people, those of you who treat Bartonella should also be um, educated in ozone therapy because it takes such a burden off the patient. Yeah? And so we, we do that at the Sophia Health Institute. You know, we do these injections morning to evening, and it's really been wonderful. In other countries um, where um, atisunate is allowed, as, uh, the US is the only country in the world where it's not allowed, even though it's got a Nobel Prize in medicine, atisunate is uh, the water soluble extract of wormwood, um, and that can also be uh, injected especially along the spine 
that can lead to dramatic pain relief with Bartonella. The typical Bartonella neck pain is a pain in the neck. <laughs> it really is. And so, <clears throat> however, in terms of the underlying tree, and when you do ozone and targeted injections, you still have to do a systematic, systemic treatment where you treat every cell in the body. The old recommendation was Zithromax and doxycycline. Um, we do not use Cipro or Leverquin, you know, because of the possible neurological long-term damage and the, the ligament damage that may occur. I think these drugs should be outdated and, and outlawed. But those of you who use antibiotics, uh, Cisromax and doxycycline, that was plus rifampin. You know? So rifampin is an old TB drug. And if you ever want to make a patient really angry, um, then give them rifampin in those patients that don't tolerate it. There's, again, there is some genetics that you can do that will predict it more uh, who should not take rifampin but you will be surprised that <laughs> pretty much every genetic test we've ever done or any patient recommends not to use rifampin to expect trouble and so and yet in that group are people that really benefit from it but um this, these cocktails you know there's either zithromax plus doxy plus rifampin sometimes people add in uh, albendazole or some of the more parasite related remedies and give dramatic cocktails, you know, for months and months and months at a time. Um, Dr. Shallow wrote this beautiful book, Treat Bartonella or Die. I think he expresses in the title very much how we all feel about it. These pictures you probably have seen, the, this weird colored stretch marks that young people get sometimes when they have Lyme disease. We had, unfortunately, when, when I first started out with this in the 80s, I had a young woman who clearly had this, and she was so broken about her looks that she committed suicide. And we kept her blood. You know, 20 years later, I did the blood test and was full of Bartonella. So that was a sad story, but keep in mind these are not, yes, they're, they're visual, they're, they're a problem, but in a certain age group, they're a really, really big problem. So just a couple of visuals. This, these are not my pictures. You've seen these in a different um, conferences. So here's a study that shows just treating with Zithromax, an 80% decrease in the lymph nodes. So with Bartonella, typically gets the big lymph nodes under the neck, where you have to make up your mind, is it strep or is it Bartonella? We use ART, and you got the answer in, in seconds. You know? so, um, I'm just reviewing with, with you this. And so the latest kit on the block with Bartonella <clears throat> is, of course, the, the work with Methylene Blue. Methylene Blue is a dye <coughs> that's been used in medicine for at least, uh, I don't know, 80 years or so. And the, <clears throat> the, the use of Methylene Blue, is, it's, it's a dye that turns your urine completely blue. And the dosage suggestions very, very greatly between giving 25 milligrams twice a day to maybe 150 or 200 milligrams twice a day. Um, it's an excellent treatment, not just for Bartonella, but for other things. But it has to be combined with another antimicrobial regime. Here in the literature, of course, the only thing it gets paid for is if you use antibiotics and you get the money from the industry that makes it. Uh, we're combining methylene blue with um, the, uh, you know, the key signs, key vita, that's our lime cocktail, and with calendula and propolis, that these are the things that we found are be used instead of the antibiotic component. But we have not found a meaningful way of replacing the methylene blue. So it's a wonderful treatment. Now, in the study here, they treated for six days and saw um, eradication of uh, Bartonella in biofilm, which is a big deal. Now, <laughs> most of us who really treat real patients, we're happy if you get there in three months. Yeah? So it's not. Uh, done in a week as it is in some of the studies, you know, but here we are. <laughs> um, 
So Babesia, Babesia, of course, is the other big kid on the block. Babesia is a protozoal organism. Um, I grew up in Germany where this was endemic, uh, Babesia. Um, just as a reminder, you know, in Africa, uh, in I think it was in 2002, 80% um, of the lion population died within a, a few months. Um, it was assumed it's a viral infection. Then the lions rebounded to some degree and maybe four or six years later was another big die off of the lions. And this time they did decent blood work and found that the lions died of Babesia. You know, it's, it's rampant in the world and not just in my area in Southern Germany where I uh, basically grew up. Um, <clears throat> Babesia, the, the main symptom we, this is kind of square on that. The main symptom is just stuff in the head. You know, Babesia really localizes in the brain, leads to the feeling of swelling in the brain, brain fog, memory loss, but also migraine headaches, real, real pain. And then Virginia Schur wrote this beautiful paper um, about the facial, sorry, about the paralysis uh, of the gut caused by a Babesia infection in the vagus nerve. You know, so that the, the bugs, that's true for Bartonella also and Borrelia, they can invade the vagus nerve and then um, basically cause uh, severe autonomic problems. Um, and so the, when the, the vagus nerve gets half paralyzed or full paralyzed, people can't digest food. You know, food moves very slowly through the gut. Um, then you think of giving agents that turn the peristaltic movement on in the gut. And with ART, we found that's very, very commonly caused by Babesia infections, and you need to focus on Babesia. So in other countries, we uh, I work in Switzerland and, and Germany, in addition to, um, to the US. So in other countries, we have wonderful results with using artisonate, yeah, injectable wormwood. Um, here in the US, um, there is a new regime that one of our friends in the community turned us on to. It's a new malaria drug that has been developed by my really, really close and admired friend Bill Gates and his foundation. Um, it's a new malaria drug. It's called Tafenoquine. And uh, Tafenoquine comes in 100 milligram tablets. And we've seen really um, some impressive results by giving this drug, it's only given once, and then you wait and you can repeat it as early as a week later, but more commonly you give it only once a month and generally uh, is at the dose of 200 milligrams. Um, it comes in a pack with, hmm, I think, 16 tablets. So it's enough for eight times 10 uh, sorry, eight times uh, for eight months, basically. Now, e e sometimes we're forced to give it more often, and uh, it's always worthwhile writing a prescription, giving it to the patient, starting the first two tablets, and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, and if the patient notices it's touching the area, it's stirring things up maybe for a few days, and then they get better, you know you're on the right track. Again, with Babesia, we never, never, ever rely on one treatment alone. Um, we, we use uh, Artemisia annua, which you can grow in your garden anywhere in the Western world. But in Europe, uh, the European Union has outlawed it because it competes with some pharmaceutical compounds. And so it's harder to get. It's very easy to get in England, you know, Artemisia annua. And then there is a concentrate of it called artemisinin that is called Artemisia forte if you uh, get it from, bio, uh, from, sorry, from Key Science in England, which is our, our preferred company to, uh, to get all the compounds that we need for treatment. I, I will get into that in, in a moment. Let's need to check on the time here quickly. Okay, I got it. So um, on artisanate, of course, there's a whole host of studies Artemisinin, one of the, the compounds made from wormwood, very, very related to artisanate, uh, got a Nobel Prize in medicine in 2015. Artisanate and extracts of Artemisia annua 
are first reported in the German literature by Hildegard von Bingen, a famous nun who was very, very active in medicine over a thousand years ago. You know, she wrote a whole um, uh, scientific paper on the use of Artemisia annua for the treatment of chronic infections, which she already knew. She had this um, psychic vision that she could see uh, pathogens in people and she knew what she was doing. So it was a fascinating history. Okay, so I'm gonna do a little excursion on that. You know, in the US, we are allowed to use Artemisia annua, the full plant. Uh, we're also allowed to use artemisinin, that's an uh, extract. Um, there's actually a, a study from, from Iran, uh, a, a thesis you know, where they compared the chemical, the biochemical extracts you know, prepared in a, in a pharmaceutical way from artemisinin and compared it with the whole plant, Artemisia annua, and they found that the whole plant works better than the Nobel Prize earning artemisinin. Um, anyway, so um, here is uh, the work of a former close friend, a wonderful cardiologist. I'm, I'm not afraid to give you his name. He did his own uh, work at the time when artisanate was legal to be used in the US and showed the dramatic increase in SOD by giving artisanate as an injection um, in relatively small doses for five days. And um, those of you who are in our field to increase SOD um, is a real, real art. And it's hugely important in the treatment of chronic infections. Yeah? This is not a published study, but it's uh, from our the time of our think tank. There were a lot of goodies that happened there that weren't followed up with. And so take it on as my job to uh, bring it back up. Okay, so I'll put here just a little bit of some of the <coughs> the earlier studies together where artemisinin or artemisia annua is mentioned as a treatment for Babesia. Um, now, artisanate and artemisia annua are not just working for Babesia. They're also great additive treatment to Bartonella, great treatment for mycoplasma, uh, great treatment for rickettsia, you know, so it, it has a huge range of, of effects, you know, but the, the core is um, in the US, you know, we're very, very restricted now what we can use, you know, the pharmaceutical runs, the uh, politics here, you know, in every corner, and every, you know, we have to be afraid um, saying anything, but Artemisia annua, you can grow in your kitchen, um, in your garden, anywhere and it's a fantastic tool and that's available you know we know uh, in the us uh, biopure has a good one in england it's key science and in europe we're not allowed to your uh, to use it <laughs> so okay here's just the formula it doesn't really matter so one of the things that in the teaching of klinghardt of me is the some people get really really sick with Lyme and other people do not <clears throat> some people get joint problems other people get neurological problems some people get brain fog and some people get eye problems ear problems nose problems lung problems whatever you know and so what's the difference well one of the predisposing factors that we found that has largely participated in this uh, pandemic of Lyme disease is the presence of aluminum nanoparticles in our system. You know, and here is one study that shows that, at least in an animal model, um, that the, um, the type of aluminum used um, in children to you know, give them the boosters um, every few months uh, with um, 60 plus different substances and now there's a new one who also contains um, aluminum nanoparticles so that creates a huge growth medium where, where your whole body is turned into a growth medium 
for Lyme disease. You know, for Borrelia burgdorferi, the most vicious of all the bugs that we have. And so keep that in mind. And then, of course, I have to explore with you where does the aluminum come from? It's not just from the jab, but you know, so first of all, for diagnosing it, we use a um, optic scan of the fascia in the hand used to be referred to as the oligo scan. Now the newer um, software of that is called the Vita scan. It's a fantastic tool because the measurement takes seconds and then there's a connection on the internet you know, where they get the results uh, within less than two minutes. Um, and they're very, very dependable results. And the, the interesting thing with this test, it's pretty much every living person the dominant toxin now in us is no longer mercury, it's no longer lead, it's no longer cadmium or nickel or any of the others. It's no longer, not even glyphosate, the leading toxin is aluminum in us. And so where does it come from? Well, I'm not going to say much because I don't want our channel here to be shut down. This is, you see that on the sky, you know, if it goes away in 30 seconds, it's just water if it stays and then spreads out and then you get the gray haze on the sky. It's um, a mix of different things, but largely they're uh, fiberglass particles, nanoparticles spiked with aluminum to create these microscopic mirrors to reflect the sun. And of course, what goes up doesn't stay up, it comes down, it's in our drinking water, it's in the air we breathe and eventually ends up in our bodies. Okay, so um, I, um, I have a suspicion here that some of it is repetitive that we went through this already, but um, so one of the most beautiful studies in homeopathy um, was done in Cuba. And um, what happens in Cuba every winter, they get leptospirosis, which is a very, very close relative to Lyme disease. It's an illness that basically half of Cuba ends up with fatigue and then is treated with repeated course of antibiotics and they come back out of it. And so Cuba developed a vaccine against um, illness. And so that wasn't practical to apply that to 5 million people. And so what they did, they created a homeopathic version of leptospirosis, a C200. And they gave that two doses of that to 2.4 or 2.3 million people in Cuba, uh, one week apart. So there's a few pallets under the tongue, a week apart, and then uh, watched out for the next two years. And the group, the 2.3 million people were compared to more than 3 million people that didn't get it. And uh, the, the result was that there was a 94% reduction in incidence of this illness in the group that had received the two homeopathic doses. Now, if anybody ever comes up, this says there's no studies on homeopathy, <laughs> it's just simply not true. There was a beautiful study. And so there's something about the C200. And so one of the things uh, we've done in my practice in Switzerland and other places where I'm practicing, we give a C200 of Borrelia. And again, we mimic this thing, we give two doses and then leave it alone. We may um, follow a little bit the LDI rules on this and give it every seven weeks, but certainly not every day. Um, that has hugely diminished symptoms on a lot of people. The trouble is to find a homeopathic that reflects the bugs in your area. And so uh, most of you who listen to this from my American friends and acquaintances know Ty Vincent's work with low dose immunotherapy and he's made a beautiful mix with many different species of Borrelia, Babesia, Bartonella, Mycoplasma and added in different species of yeast and different species of parasites as a homeopathic. You know, these are low potencies, you, know, you need to, on your own, dilute it up to get to the um, dilution that you think is the one that you want to use. It says, I mentioned this here to, to my friends here, so I'm talking sort of between the lines, what we're doing with that. Okay, so yes, people have looked at the effect of Lyme disease with different combinations of antibiotics. 
the more well-known one was daptomycin a few years ago, and then it turns out it's very expensive, doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, and the clinical results are just not that great. But um, it's there, and it's probably a better regime than what we had before. The cephalosporin, doxycycline, and daptomycin. Okay, so the here, again, like here is an interesting um, comparison uh, with the combination of cephalosporin and desulfuram, which I mentioned before, or the cephalosporin plus biaxin. And uh, one without the desulfuram was doing better uh, in this study. So it puts a question mark a little bit more over the desulfuram. So here's a study that confirms sort of what we've been doing. <coughs> The, um, this is a study that compares the use of antibiotics um, and then goes into a whole list of herbs that were tried out, or if you're in England, herbs that were tried out. <coughs> the word herbs makes me cough. <coughs> and so they tested for two different forms of Lyme disease, the active um, form, that responded dramatically strong to Artemisia anua, uh, sorry, uh, to uh, Japanese knotweed, <coughs> Polygonum cuspidatum. That is Japanese knotweed high in resveratrol, and that was the main um, natural thing to really kill the alive, <coughs> the alive form of Lyme disease. Trailing behind it was cryptolepis. It's an African herb that we've been using for Babesia now for 10 years, but we didn't know it was also equally effective for Borrelia. Now, <coughs> there is a dormant form of Lyme that was also tested here, the cystic form, and that responded really, really well to Artemisia annua. Yeah, and so based on that and many other studies, we formulated our protocol, uh, <coughs> how to treat these illnesses. And so I'm going to um, go into that with you now. So um, foundational therapy in, in our world, in our system, is to work with Sardinian red cystus tea. This is a very sturdy, unusual plant that basically lives without water and certain parts in Sardinia where it grows and it has the highest amount of polyphenols and essential oils in it of this particular species and published has wonderful anti-spirochetal activity, uh, but also is a biofilm breaker, also has added benefits as a anti-yeast, anti-mold agent. And um, just a uh, little clinical tip, when you get that from key science, it comes in bags, <coughs> you make the tea, um, it should be golden color, the first batch you do. So you bring it to a boil, <coughs> you turn off the stove, let it simmer for maybe half an hour or so, and then pour it off, decant it, and connect the, the tea. That's your first batch. That has completely different ingredients in it. Then you leave the leaves in the pot, yeah, with just a little bit of water left on it. And the next day or hours later, you add water again, and you bring it again to a boil. And this time you simmer it for about an hour. And there's a certain point when the fluid turns red. And these are polyphenols that come out that have fantastic properties um, in treating Lyme disease and many of the co-infections. Um, there's a German study from the German military uh, that shows when you give dogs uh, cystus tea before you send them in the forest, they did a study, you know, the 100 dogs that drank cystus tea before and another 100 that didn't, and um, for every 100 ticks that the non sisters dogs came back with, the sisters dogs only had one tick. So it's a dramatic protective effect 
from, uh, yeah, from dick bites. Um, <clears throat> good. And then the, you know, the second issue is when you start engaging and killing things in the body, uh, the body needs to get rid of the dead bodies and uh, the bugs that are killed, they're not going away easily. They're squirting out their biotoxins to punish you as much as they can in their death or in their leaving. Um, they're leaving basically with a mm, and to mop up the, the substances, the biotoxins and their immune modulators and they're, they're all things that the bugs are trying to survive in you. And so the, um, the way to deal with that is to put so-called binders on board. You know, there was an idea that I formulated 40 years ago that's now in everybody's mouth. Um, we have a couple of favorites, um, but amongst the favorites is chlorella and zeolite. You know, we don't have to go into that, you know, but the, the zeolite we're getting from key science is fantastic. The chlorella has to be clean, pure. Uh, chlorella has a cell membrane that's able to bind a huge amount of toxic materials. Um, chlorella is an intelligent binder. It only binds things that are toxic to the algae, which are the same things that are toxic to us, but it doesn't bind zinc and it doesn't bind molybdenum and the things that we need. Uh, zeolite is a stupid binder, it binds everything. Um, <clears throat> but uh, as it turned out, especially in the aftermath now of COVID, um, that the spike protein behaves like a prion, and uh, zeolite is the only thing that's been found to bind and neutralize prions. So it's a big deal. So, and then in terms of the herbal treatment that we're adding to this, it's the it starts with the mix of the leading herbs that were published in the treatment of Babesia, Bartonella, Mycoplasma, and, and Borrelia. And again, um, <clears throat> Polygonum cuspidatum is the leading ingredient, but there's others. Um, the um, crypto lettuce we use as a separate product as, as the reason is that there is not a stable supply of it. It comes from Africa and uh, the, the, the sources um, a change and every batch needs to be tested more carefully than other sources. And so we, we didn't add it into the, the main mix, but it's, it's an option. Um, so we have basically, we have a selection of, in, in addition to this combination remedy, we have a selection of um, herbal tinctures that are known to have huge effects in this area. Yeah, that that includes a single uh, selection of andrographis and artemisia, skullcap, populis, uh, smilax, um, but there's a whole host of others. And so the way we work uh, with ART is that we test the patient for Lyme disease and then we use the O-ring test, which is really a wonderful tool and test every single one of the herbal tinctures against the patient. What we usually come up with is a mix of three, four different herbal tinctures. And then depending on how it tests, we get a, a jar, a glass jar that has a lid that we can close. And we put largely equal amounts of that in there, <coughs> like a shot glass full of Japanese knotweed, a shot glass full of kibita, a shot glass full of uh, cilantro and a shot glass full of microfrost. These are the phospholipids, <coughs> the most expensive and best you can buy on the market. They have a very, very tiny molecule size and they create these little fat bubbles around the herbal extracts. And in that form, the herbs are absorbed beautifully and they find their way into the nervous system of the patient and into the deep structures. <coughs> so you may have five or six shot glasses of these tinctures, put them in a glass jar, plus phospholipids, we shake it up. <coughs> and then if you really wanna turn it on, the, the, the power of these, we use a jewelry cleaner that costs about 30 bucks. 
put water in it, set the glass in there and vibrate um, this, this mix of herbs that makes a more deeply liposomal um, dilution of the herbs. And then we put that back into a dropper bottle and then we dose test the patient. They, why is this, why do we do it this way? Well, what we found out is uh, if Japanese not, <coughs> not we did test well and anographers test well, we may need four pipettes of not wheat twice a day, and we may need four pipettes of andrographis twice a day. But if you mix them together like this, we only need two pipettes each. So the more of synergistic herbs we get together, the less of the individual ones we need. That's really all I can say. The, the big breakthroughs for, for me came by using ART having ways of testing the individual herbs and combining them in meaningful ways and um, preparing them liposomally. And then the, usually we give the patients the, the dropper bottle with the mix and then the patient self-titrates the dose up. So the very sensitive patients that start like with two drops twice a day and the more sturdy people like myself, they may start with two dropperfuls twice a day. Yeah, so it's a, um, and the patient tips toes their way up until they get symptoms or some of the symptoms get aggravated or some of the symptoms improve. We have, when there's a change, if it's unpleasant, we tell them to back off just a little bit and hang there. And then after a few days, trying to push it up and push it up and push it up until the patient gets to what we assume will be the effective dose. The effective dose of these herbal combinations is usually start somewhere um, with a teaspoon, one to two teaspoons twice a day. Um, the, the experience with Lyme disease, it's better to give a high dose twice a day than a smaller dose 15 times a day. So we don't want to spread out the medicine. You give a hard hitting dose and then back off and then another hard hitting dose later in the day. So, um, but for you guys who don't use muscle testing, the simple recipe for Lyme is you use a sister's tea, you work up again to six to eight cups a day, both versions of it, the first brew and the second brew. And then you give a binder, let's say zeolite, you do a half a teaspoon, two, three times a day between meals. And you use key beta as the uniform mix. And you start again, you start with a few drops a couple of times a day. And if that's the only thing you're using, you quickly go up until you do two, three, four teaspoons twice a day. Um, and if you want to put fire in it, it's already liposomal, but you can add more phospholipids to it to give it a stronger effect on the nervous system. Good. And then um, <clears throat> I put here, there is a couple of things that we do always alongside um, the Lyme treatment. So first one is the aluminum detox. Yeah? And the most important thing that we found is the ionic foot bath. It has become a firm part of our Lyme treatment. The ionic foot bath, it's a friend of ours in England, uh, Margarita Gris Brisson, a neurologist, a Harvard trained, who did all the footwork on this. She, she uh, had patients do the foot bath and then um, examine the urine excretions of toxic metals. They didn't look in the water that comes out by the feet, but she looked simply in the urine of patients and found out that between eight hours post foot bath up to 72 hours after a foot bath, there's a dramatic increase in renal excretion of toxic metals, but also of glyphosate and other things. And there's nothing else that will do that that effectively. So rather than relying on, on biochemistry and biochemical compounds to pull toxins out of the system, we use biophysics. You know, there's been a fantastic advantage. There's a, a particular herbal product called Polmolo from Key Science that is, can dramatically stimulate the uh, intracellular release of aluminum into the extracellular environment. So you get just more bang for the buck. 
Good, that's one aspect. The other one is the hyaluronic acid. Yeah, so um, I'm hacking on that in my other courses, but I tell you what we did. This is like 30 years ago. I had a dark field microscopy in the office. And so basically we looked at the blood of a patient, you know, that we knew had Lyme disease and we put the slide under the, 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 uh, the microscope and often it would take hours or even days before hatching out of the white blood cells and red blood cells are these little worm-like spirochetes. It took sometimes days, two, three days when the conditions in the cells became unlivable for the spirochetes, they come out and they're looking for a new home. And so what we did, I added in different things to see, can we speed that up? <laughs> and so we used hyaluronic acid, you know, by, by put the, the slides under the microscope and rather than just putting the drop of blood there and waiting, um, we added a tiny, tiny amount of hyaluronic acid to that. And the amazing thing happened that within minutes, the spirochetes started streaming out of the red blood cells. And it turns out the reason um, Lyme spirochetes are in certain areas of the body, because they're addicted to hyaluronic acid. It's high in joints, it's high in, in nervous system membranes and so on and so forth. And so um, by putting a few drops of hyaluronic under the tongue, we found a highly sublingually absorbable hyaluronic acid by putting that under the tongue you get the absorption and uh, it circulates through your bloodstream through the lymphatics and very quickly within half an hour an hour the the amount of microbes in your blood that have left their biofilm home and are now circulating in the bloodstream hugely increases and in that form the bugs can be killed very easily yeah, so rather than finding things or giving things in astronomical high doses that forces medication into this biofilm where the bugs live, we just simply ask the bugs to come out where they can be killed much easier. Yeah, and so take it or leave it. You know, if we on, on average I use like two pipettes of the hyaluronic acid, maybe three or four times a day, sublingually away from other things. So. It takes a few minutes for that to be absorbed. Okay, and then I mentioned here, of course, that this is uh, my passion here is that the uh, Wi Fi environment that we live in currently seems to be the driver, not just of the Lyme pandemic, but also the other pandemic that we're having right now, where the, the 5G um, is a huge aspect of that. Um, but we're not allowed to talk about that. And so, and that's Dietrich, yeah. sorry to interrupt. You only have uh, three minutes left. So okay. I don't want to interrupt. Yeah. 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 So the last one on this slide is that I mentioned that before that every insect bite that gives you bacterial infections or protozoal infections is likely to also insert different viruses into your system because the, the insects are themselves infected. And there is this group of viruses called insect retroviruses. Um, and so many, many of our Lyme patients that come to me from other parts of the world that didn't get well with other types of treatment uh, using ART and using the CD26 and some of the more specific tests for retroviruses, um, test positive, and then we put them on our regime for uh, retroviral infections. You know, there's uh, a powder that Key Science made, it's called the Retro V powder. Judy Mikovits has advised us to sometimes also use Truvada, the medical drug that um, largely is known in the gay community. Um, and that has been absolutely fantastic. And adding that aspect of treating chronic infections to it, that most of our chronic ill patients also have active retroviral infections. You know, the lab parameters that are available uh, is Rantes is one of the, the tests when it goes high. Uh, Nagalase is the other one uh, that some of you may be familiar with when those levels go high. Nagalase should be 0 .06, 0 0.65 or low, lower, and if it goes up to two or three, 
we know the patient has massive retroviral infections and this becomes an absolute must to include that. That's something I tried to educate my friends at ILADS and was kind of rejected uh, with the idea because it wasn't theirs. But, but uh, it's a thing that stands in the room and should be highly considered. You know, like everybody's focusing now on mold because there is more charismatic speakers on the mold issue than on the retroviral issue. Um, Dr. Bradstreet was, you know, taken out. And so we, we lost uh, the leadership in, in that field, but uh, it didn't make the retrovirus just go away. It's a huge issue. Okay, so uh, I just mentioned here at the end, yes, mold as a synergistic effect with Lyme disease and it's an old conflict between Richie Shoemaker and others is the mold first and then comes the lime or is the lime first and then the mold comes well at least the mold is still uh, natural it, it's a natural mold that always existed um, the mold gets angry with when you bombard it with wi-fi and creates more biotoxins but it's still the good old mold whereas the Borrelia burgdorferi is not the good old spirochetes is a, there's a man-made aspect to it it makes it much more vicious and needs the special attention to it. You know? The way we deal with the mold, you know, in, instead of using sporonox and uh, diflucan and all those things, I like to use the ozonated plant oils, um, especially Rhizol Gamma. Uh, Key Science is the leader in, in Europe with that. Uh, in America, BioPure has some of them. And um, we have ways of cleaning up the home with propolis vapor, this goes beyond this talk now. And we certainly have developed many ways of using biophysics. I know most of you are aware of the Rife machines, you know, the pulsed frequency devices uh, that can disable the propagation of Lyme bugs and that can make them basically infertile. <laughs> That's the same as we do with Wi-Fi now to people. We can do that with more simple frequency devices to the bugs in us, you know, we can make them sterile basically, or not have an appetite to copulate with each other. And so they slowly die out. Um, but there is elegant ways of doing that. Um, I count homeopathy also under biophysics, you know, homeopathy ultimately is just frequency medicine. The uh, frequency specific microcurrent is strongly emerging as a treatment in, in the US. In Germany, emerging is the work with light. You know, the photon wave and the K scan are our leading treatments with that, and they're, they're fantastic. So, um, maybe to sum this up so, in order to treat Lyme disease, I, uh, in my experience, it is not needed to resort to antibiotics. If you work with antibiotics, it's a bit more simple, the choices are less. When you work with herbs, there's an endless number of choices. And there are certain ways of dealing with herbs that take a little bit more, maybe sophisticated approach, you know, but it's the antimicrobial effects that we're after. The beautiful thing with herbs is all of them are also immune modulating and you get a double whammy, you get the bioflavonoids and polyphenols and things that have their own independent healing effects that are very dramatic, you know, and so, I like to leave it here. Let me see if there's any more things. You know, okay, the artisanate I mentioned, the ozone inject, ozone injections I mentioned, Desferal was just taken away from us. DMPS has a big role in treatment of Lyme disease, and then melatonin and high doses has been a godsend in the treatment of chronic Lyme, especially the mental symptoms. We don't use it for sleep melatonin, but it's a fantastic anti-inflammatory for the brain. B venom therapy is my personal favorite. So with that, um, I say goodbye for now. Thank you, Dietrich. Uh, Thank you so much.